Excellent. Okay, so my name is Jillian Kerr. Um, I'm with the Center for Local Prosperity, and I'm uh, thrilled to be here. I'm an ecological economist that work on environmental issues, so this has been a fire hose three days of learning about food, and I'm thrilled because it's exceptionally important. Uh, as you all know more than I do, food supply can be most secure when dedicated community residents come together and work together with such things as the production of food, food education, skills building, and cooperating in food purchasing and production. We couldn't have a better group of people to spend time talking about this, so I'm not going to say much more, except to say I've spent a little time with all of these guys. I'm I think they're fantastic. I've learned a lot. Don and I have been working together for the last couple of months, pretty much texting each other every day. Um, so I'm just going to do a brief introduction of our panel. The order that we've decided to go in by geography and topic will be Catherine, then Phil, Wendy, and Don. And in our pre-meeting, our team decided they would go for about 10 minutes each, which gives us about 20 minutes for Q&A at the end. So please write your questions down or try to remember them. So Don Matheson currently works at the Onaweg Education Center as, food security, as the Food Security Initiative Project Coordinator. She lives in Millbrook First Nation, which is located just outside of Truro. She, uh, her, she lives with her spouse, her five children, and one fur baby. And she has a passion for family, culture, food, so learning and sharing new things while gardening is a perfect match for her. Anecdotally, she also was like, hey Jillian, I have a moose. Pardon me? I got a moose. What do you mean? A whole frozen moose. I'm like, I am not dealing with that. So somebody else cut up the moose, obviously. Uh, Phil Ferrero is a founding director of the Institute for Bioregional Studies. He is also CEO and PEI at the PEI Farm Center, which he manages on one of the Legacy Gardens, which is one of Canada's largest urban farms. He's, uh, he is on the board of Gifts for the Heart, Inc. He is also an advisor for the Center for Local Prosperity and the director of the innovation program Engaging Youth in the Era of Climate Change. Catherine Carey is the community farm coordinator, coordinator at the North Grove, a community hub in the heart of Dartmouth North. She runs the farm with a group of dedicated community volunteers, as well as the children's farm program, a community garden, a weekly food market, and a workshop for adults. Catherine has worked uh, with farms and nonprofits across Canada, as well as four years in Cape Town, South Africa, supporting small-scale urban farmers. And last but not least, all the way from Dorchester, we have Wendy. Wendy has worked in community economic development for over 40 years and has been involved in dozens of community-driven food security initiatives. She's a lifelong volunteer and has don donated and devoted much of her time over the past several years to the Greater Dorchester Moving Forward Cooperative, which is a nonprofit organization with a mission to rebuild the population and local economy. With that, I would like to turn it over to Catherine for 10 minutes. And I do have a large, you know, the old uh, hook. So if they get too long, the hook will be coming out. Hello. There you go. Um, I just wanted to say, it's one of those, I have the microphone, so I'm going to say this. Uh, just tacking on to the conversation in the last panel, I just wanted to say I have learned so much from the organization No One is Illegal um, to do with migrant farm workers. So if you're curious about that, I would say check them out. Um, okay, so my name is Catherine, and I am the community farm and market coordinator for the North Grove. Uh, we are a community hub in... Uh, in Dartmouth North, we serve 500 meals a week. We do cooking classes. We do affordable, a weekly affordable market. We have a community farm. We do parenting classes. We do much more. Um, everything we do is free, and we don't means test um, who comes. We let people self-select, which is really important to us. Um, yeah, we are located in Dartmouth North, um, Halifax's lowest income neighborhood. Uh, I think, I haven't looked at the latest data. Um, it's very densely populated. Most people live in rental apartments without balconies or green space. Um, many of the residents of Dartmouth North are single parents or seniors living alone with mobility issues. Uh, they're also kind, brilliant, funny, welcoming, and they are what make uh, the North Grove special. So our 20,000 square foot community farm sits in the heart of Dartmouth North. We have 50 garden plots looked after by community members. 
a greenhouse, a children's play area, chickens, fruit trees, berry bushes, a butterfly house, and farm rows that are worked by, by a very dedicated group of volunteer farm stewards. Um, our volunteers contribute more than 2,000 hours of work on the farm throughout the season, and they make it a pretty fun place to be. I say 2,000 hours, that's a guess, because they're often coming by on Saturdays and Sundays when I'm not there and spending eight hours a day weeding. I love them. Um, seven years ago, our farm was an empty lot that people cut through on their way to the drugstore. Now people cut through and stop to ask me questions about plants. They sample new varieties of tomatoes uh, or say hello to the chickens who are absolute fan favorites in the community. Um, I run gardening workshops for adults, uh, seed saving, natural fabric dyeing, tomato pruning, um, and I facilitate a young farmers program for children aged 6 to 12. Pulling up carrots is hands down everyone's favorite task. The main reason I grow carrots, or the main reason I grow so many, is because they are so much fun for kids and adults to harvest. Um, it's always a shock. You pull up a carrot and there's a carrot there. Wow. Um, um, you should see, they're, they like, they eat it without cleaning it and just like dirt smears all over everyone's faces. Um, every week during the school year, we host a grade seven class from the local middle school. This school is under-resourced and has a bad reputation. I've heard lots of parents say they avoid sending their children there. But these kids are curious, engaged, and absolutely hilarious. Last, uh, last week, we, we've been working in the garden until now. Now it's too cold. But last week, we planted our 500 cloves of garlic, mostly the correct way around. Um, <laughs> there was like, can I eat this? And I'm like, well, you can. But you know, usually cooking it, turn around, they've eaten the, the garlic clove raw. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's, uh, and if you know this age group, you'll know they are, tend to be bouncing off the walls, even, and when there's no walls and you're out in the garden, they're bouncing further, um, and they're asking a million questions. We'll pause in our work to talk about the insects we're finding in the soil, remind certain students that earthworms are not edible for humans, um, or eat kale straight from the plant, like literally no hands. Um, one memorable day, everyone insisted on trying the hot chilies we had growing in the greenhouse. There was tears and laughter. Um, I try to bring the countryside to our urban setting as well. A lot of our, you know, we're a uh, densely, or densely populated area with a lot of rental apartments, so a lot of people are coming from other places, um, you know, from, from the countryside, from, from other countries where they're used to having more space. So I try and, you know, bring those kind of rural elements to our community farm. So I built a farm stand where I put produce for community members to pick up, free of charge of course. We put a lot of effort into cleaning, labeling, and bundling our produce. Um, people who are in poverty deserve food that is delicious but also beautiful and presented with dignity. Um, uh, chickens are a great example of our uh, countryside in the city. Um, many people have come to tell me that they remember chickens on their grandparents' farms in Cape Breton or Manitoba or India. Children get to grab eggs still warm from the nesting boxes and the chickens get a lot of treats. These are the most spoiled chickens in uh, Nova Scotia. When the chickens arrived, we held a vote on names with 150 ballots cast. Their names are Chickpea and Princess Leia. Um, our final hen is named Tony Mancini after a city councillor who donated the funds for the chickens. Um, Tony the politician and Tony the chicken um, get along. I'll say that. Uh, it's really funny to hear small children be like, Tony Mancini poked on me. And I'm like, yeah, okay. Like, this is great. <laughs> um, uh, we grow only about 3,000 pounds of food each year on our tenth of an acre. But every pound of food comes with connection. And in an increasingly frightening world where housing prices um, continue to soar and um, hunger inc continues to, to grow, grassroots connection is what will save people. Um, aside from the farm, I also run a weekly affordable market for the community with the help of 28, sometimes 29, sometimes 40 dedicated volunteers. People love it. Usually I have more people than I can give tasks to. Um, the North Grove bulk buys produce and sells it at a reduced cost thanks to generous supporters. We haven't had to raise our prices since 2018, um, which is incredible. Um, and thanks to a partnership with Feed Nova Scotia, potatoes, onions, and eggs are always free. Um, and the function of this is to get food to people, but it also means that when people tell me, well, I can't come to your market because I don't have any money, I'll say, well, there is some free items, and then that's connecting them with, you know, looking at being able to look at the prices, and then when they maybe do have a couple bucks, they'll spend it um, with us if they can and get a little more. Um, 
As well, we have a partnership with a local artisanal butcher, Vessel Meats, who sells us their product at cost. So it's $1.50 for a half pound of pork, for example. Um, and now we have halal meat as well. Um, this combined with produce that we grow on our farm, which is always free, means that with a few dollars or none, people can walk away with bags of groceries for their week. Um, we also sell small portions of spices for 10 cents each. Herbs and spices can go a long way to making basic, basic meals delicious and varied. Um, and it's a great opportunity to talk to our customers about their cooking ideas. Um, there's a lot of, what should I use this for? Um, with the help of our middle schoolers, each week we put together soup kits with all our free items, um, as well as items that are overrepresented in our little food bank, as well as such as like canned beans. There's always tons of them. Um, each week has a recipe and ingredients to make a hearty meal with pantry supplies. And for whatever reason, the middle schoolers like absolutely love doing it, like so much, like more than planting. I thought, yeah, anyway, um, they love it. And people really like being able to, to buy the, the food kits. Um, from my experience, I believe that people who are truly doing frontline food security and advocacy work aren't necessarily those who are working for organizations like me. It's the people who are living with food insecurity themselves. They are the ones using their resourcefulness to feed their families, look after their neighbors, and check on their friends. Um, and that's why community building is so important, because at the end of the day, it's the community who supports one another. Um, and our community, I just want to give you some examples. And I've changed people's names for privacy because, you know, Nova Scotia's a small town. Um, Susan, who only has a $7 a month for food after uh, her rent is paid, um, but who always makes time to volunteer each week. It's Sophia, who brings, each, each week brings groceries from the market to at least six other seniors in her building. For a while, it was like 35, and we had to be like, Sophia it might be a little hard on you. <laughs> let's, let's find a way to make this easier. Um, it's Thomas who's in his 80s and is at the farm every day to lend a helping hand. It's a family who just arrived in Canada last week from Nigeria who visited us to get groceries and ended up getting connected with settlement resources and support. It's John who visits the chickens three times a day, rain or shine, and says they are his favorite people to talk to. Um, <laughs> It's Paul and Diane who are both blind and shop at the market every week, um, I think in large part because they get the help of the volunteer team. Um, it's Justine who told me that her garden plot is what's keeping her alive. Um, and it's Muhammad and Fatima who bring us herbs from their garden each week to give away and who organized a farm volunteer day with the mosque this summer. I wish I could have brought all these people with me today for you to meet, and I do invite you all to come visit when you have the chance. I am really proud of the work that we do, but more than that, I am proud to know the incredible, resilient people of Dartmouth North. Hey, it's your turn. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, yeah, I uh, work in Charlottetown. Um, the, the farm center, which is located pretty well in the geographic center of the city. Um, and back in 2014, um, we created a, uh, a garden immediately behind the center, uh, which we've named the uh, Legacy Garden. I'll talk about that in a minute, but I, I just wanted to mention an article that I read yesterday. Um, apparently, Tesla is coming out with a fleet of electronic semi-trucks that will be launched December 1st. And, you know, it sounded great, right? Electric cars, you know, yeah, saving the environment. And the article went on to say that a typical truck stop, like we have right down the road, if it were servicing all electric trucks, it would need the electrical power equivalent to a small town. And even a gas station, a typical gas station, if it was to serve just all electric cars as we have today at a typical gas station, would require the amount of electricity equivalent to a professional sports stadium. Okay? So I'm not saying electric vehicles won't work. I'm not saying they're not the future. But what I do want to point out is that the technology is really not there yet to serve the food system that we're accustomed to in a manner that we expect in terms of global transport. The infrastructure is just not there. You know, in addition to that, you know, the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has, 
has warned us rather sternly that the food system isn't possibly going to collapse. They've said it's going to collapse. And so that the type of discussions that we've been having over this weekend, you know, they're not just novel alternative ideas. It's really a necessity. And it's very encouraging to see so many small groups uh, working collaboratively. And uh, I know I'm walking away from this conference feeling much more positive about the possibility of a, of a local food system. And I, I don't think we're trying, you know, what my biggest concern was coming here was that people were going to try to replace the current food system. And I think if we just work on having a parallel food system that works in our neighborhoods, that works in our region, uh, nothing's going to stop us. Anyway, Legacy Garden. Um, as I mentioned, I started it, we started it in 2014. Uh, the, uh, the land that we're on is uh, the government's experimental farm, uh, Agriculture Canada. It happens to be the oldest experimental farm in Canada and uh, the only experimental farm in the country that allows public access. So when we realized that, we said, okay, this is possible. And I looked through some old archives in the government and realized that during the war, there were all sorts of victory gardens on this land. So it wasn't like we were trying to create something new, we were just trying to bring something back. And uh, when I first made a proposal to the federal government, um, they said, yeah, sure, you can lease that eight and a half acres, it'll cost you $350,000 a year. <laughs> and I said, no, 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 we're not building a shopping mall, uh, we're building a, an, an urban farm, the land is zoned agricultural, we'll pay you agricultural land prices. Yes, it is. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so anyway, after a fair bit of negotiation, we did get it back to the point where uh, we do pay the government to be there, which I find equally interesting because we're managing eight and a half acres of the federal government's land and we have to pay for it. They should be paying us. <laughs> anyway. Um, so uh, on this land, uh, we've grown consistently over the years. We now have a little over 200 community garden plots. Uh, I'd say 60, 70 percent of those plots are uh, newcomers to Canada. Uh, so it's really exciting to walk through the gardens and see uh, certain vegetables uh, that uh, you wouldn't recognize. Uh, we have uh, these white eggplants that are a little bit bigger than an egg. Uh, we have uh, amaranth growing in numerous beds. Uh, as a, uh, a vegetable that uh, people are harvesting all season long, freezing it and making stews and whatever they do with it. Um, and what's mostly interesting is uh, the number of newcomers that go through the garden and are harvesting things like lamb quarters that I mentioned yesterday and other weeds that uh, they find as edible vegetables. So it's a really a great experience for that. Um, Within the garden, because it's in the middle of the city and it has public access, try to keep it as park-like as possible. Um, so we have a, a commons area with picnic tables, a fire pit, and barbecue, uh, which serves a lot of purposes. One is uh, the people that work nearby come to the garden, have lunch there. Um, it's a great way for community gardeners to get to know each other rather than just tending their own plot. Uh, and around that commons area, we have a huge strawberry patch that encircles the whole space. And uh, so people come pick strawberries and, you know, get a chance to talk. Uh, we also have a memorial garden where people are invited to plant a tree or a shrub in memory of somebody that they may have lost. Uh, we have an herb garden, of course. Um, and we have a tree nursery that we use as a fundraiser. So uh, we sell fruit trees every spring, and uh, this year we're hoping to provide a service to uh, actually plant them for people, but uh, it's great to uh, be able to do that. Um, and then we have our, what we call our Goodwill Garden, which is where our staff spends most of, oh, we also have a food forest or a, a mixed orchard where we have uh, 
pears, plums, uh, chums, if you're familiar with them, uh, hascap berries, blueberries, raspberries, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, you know, I could talk about the, uh, the value of having a mixed fruit orchard like that over a standard orchard, which I also manage uh, up the street. Uh, and the difference in the terms of the amount of work is just phenomenal. Uh, the food forest is, is virtually no work compared to the other one. Um, and uh, yeah, so in our, uh, in our Goodwill garden, um, it's, uh, it's about an acre. Uh, one of the general rules of organic farming that I've learned long ago is that half your land should always be in uh, cover crop. So we, the, uh, the acre is in strips. So we have uh, uh, 15 foot wide strips of landscape fabric where we grow food and then a 15 foot wide strip that's cover cropped. And uh, then each year we just flip the uh, fabric over to the area that was cover cropped. Really? Oh my goodness. <laughs> ah! Okay, so anyway, I won't get into that. Uh, so we give away about 20,000 pounds of food each year to uh, various charities. And uh, two years ago, we started a therapeutic horticulture program. So uh, we work with uh, young people that have autism. Uh, we work with uh, people that are recovering from addictions. And we're starting to work with people now that have uh, post-traumatic stress disorder as well. And uh, gee, there's so much more I wanted to talk about. I didn't think I'd be able to fill 10 minutes. But uh, <laughs> I'll be around or come visit us. We're easy to find right in the middle of Charlottetown. Okay, thank you. I always get behind Phil. He's a hard act to follow. But, uh, you know, giving me 10 minutes to talk about uh, something I'm passionate about is quite un unfair, Julian, I have to tell you. <laughs> but I'm scared of your hook, so I brought some notes with me, try to keep me on track. So I'm with a small community organization called Greater Dorchester Moving Forward. And I don't know if folks know where Dorchester is. Most times when you hear Dorchester, people think prison. Um, and they kind of think that's the core of the, of the community. And I can tell you right now that we hardly even notice it's there. Nobody works there. It's really not. So I want to tell you the real story um, of this amazing little community. So first of all, it's um, nestled on the banks of the Memram Cook River, which is a tidal river. It's at the head of the Bay of Fundy. It's part of the Fundy Biosphere Reserve, and it serves as a living laboratory to all kinds of terrestrial and coastal um, research. At one time, it was, well, it still is the Shire town of the county, but it was the main area. We had Fathers of Confederation there. It was um, just a booming economy. But like lots of, all of, I think, our small rural communities across Atlantic Canada, over the years as a result of many really bad policy decisions like putting a Trans-Canada Highway way, way out, you know, so you surpassed all of the, um, all the small communities building a regional high school where kids had to be bused out of uh, the community. So, you know, really the population declined, the economy uh, declined, and there was a real sense of apathy, like there's nothing we can do. We've tried everything, there's nothing we can do. And then in 2016, something happened that just woke the whole community up. The provincial government announced that they were going to close the remaining K-8 to school, the only school left in the community. And people just decided that was enough. And so they rallied, and we got together. We <laughs> said, what do we have to do? We developed an economic development plan for the community. We went en masse to the government and asked for a reprieve, which we got for four years. So I'm going to jump to the end of the story. I'd love to tell you all of the amazing things that came out of that. But today, um, we have doubled the population of the school, and it is a UNESCO designate school now, and that is, you know, because excellence in learning, environmental stewardship, innovation, and community engagement. 
And so one of the projects, just in, that's what I'm here to talk to you about, is an aquaponics lab that we installed in the school. Um, it's a huge classroom sized um, uh, initiative, like the whole, it takes up the whole classroom. There's about a thousand feet. How many people here have seen an aquaponics system before? So some of you have. So for everybody else, just kind of close your eyes and imagine this. There's about a thousand feet of PVC pipe that runs uh, across staging throughout the room. It has two giant fish tanks that are now filled with um, trout. We'd started out with goldfish. That was a whole fun story. <laughs> <laughs> And in these pipes are spaced so far apart, little round holes into which you put your seed in a little pod. And there's one root that grows down. And it's all run on water. And so there's nothing that goes into these plants at all, simply fish poop. And uh, it is the most eco-friendly way of growing food. So it uses about one-sixth of the water and to grow eight times as much food. It's in a controlled environment, and that's one of the things that's, you know, emerging when we look at some of the add-ons, like Phil was talking about, you know, we have to do more than what we're doing now. So these kinds of controlled environment agriculture, so aquaponics, hydroponics, greenhouse, and so on, are super innovative, but they're also a sustainable food system that can help supplement. But the cool thing about this project is that the kids are in there all the time. They feed the fish, they're taking the nitrate levels, planting and germinating the seeds, they're harvesting the food. And they take the food, then we don't have a lunch program at our school, so they take two days a week. Now the kids go and harvest the food and they make salads for all the kids in the school. We have enough left over. We can, at full production, produce um, 150 plants a week. We've added media beds, which is uh, just a, another aquaponic system that you can use to grow larger plants than you can in these little pods. Um, we've now added hydroponics system to it as well. And so we're producing enough food that we started a community fridge, and especially in these last few years, we've really noticed growing in, in uh, food insecurity. So we established a community fridge, and so we put the produce from that. We are now moving into um, developing a community food hub. So, you know, the difference between small rural communities and, you know, some of the larger centers is we have no infrastructure. We don't have a commercial kitchen where we can process food. We don't have, you know, storage or anything like that. So we're now in the process of um, developing a community food hub. And um, did I do it, Julian? How am I doing? You got four minutes. I got. Oh my God! Well, I have so much else I could tell you about. But you know, just I guess some of the other things. And it was the the way that this happened. And I think that's part of the beautiful story, is that we had. Uh, I was working with a youth on another project when COVID hit, and he was building an urban aquaponics farm in St. John and he couldn't move it forward, and he said, geez, I always wanted to do this thing in a school. Um, you know, what do you think? So I said, give me five minutes, and I picked up the phone and called Gordy, the principal, and said, hey, you got a classroom, you know, you want to build this? He's like, yeah. Um, so uh, th then I called somebody that gives this little $5,000 food grant, and, you know, can you give us this $5,000? Yeah, sure. We were starting on that project in three weeks. We didn't think about anything. Like we just dove in with both feet and it just came together like it should, like the community jumped in. We had some people that had aquaponics um, backgrounds that came and helped. We did not know what we were doing. And yet it's all worked out beautifully and it's just really brought the community together and the kids engaged. And so, you know, it, it grew out of just an idea and when community really buys into something, there's nothing that stops them. And that's why I called my little presentation the little community that could. Um, you know, because the, now you go into that community, and I mentioned this sense of apathy before, it's unbelievable. People are just so engaged and, and so excited about being part of the community because they were empowered to do something about it. We haven't relied on government for any of this outside of, you know, just having um, the support of our school. It's been great. 
um, partners are coming to the table all the time. One of the things that we realized was every time we mentioned this, people were so enthusiastic about it and they wanted to come and do visits and we said, well, the, we're one, thank you. We're one organization, but there are many others. And so, you know, some of our partner schools have greenhouses. I see some folks here from New Brunswick that I know that are just doing amazing things. And, uh, you know, so just by pulling those people together, being innovative, empowering the community, we're just seeing a whole new, um, a whole new vibrancy. So, thank you. So, Wendy, you said Phil was a hard act to follow. I just want to make sure that you know that you're all a hard act to follow. And as you know from last night, I don't have any notes, so you know where this is coming from. <laughs> I'm pulling it out again. So, um, my name is Don Matheson, and I, first, before I begin, I want to say I'm honored to be able to sit here with you, but I'm also honored to be here and sitting in this room with you as well, because I think we have so many voices and so many, um, like, I just love the fact that I get to talk to everybody. Right, because I'm making all these connections. So I work for Olnoeg Education Center. So what Olnoeg Education Center does is we support um, indigenous communities and a lot of our funding is through um, ESDC, which is helping indigenous youth make that step to post-secondary education, right? To make those connections to support them. So we go into communities and we do a lot of different programming. So we do like robotic arms and we do like we have the new one coming out is um, prosthetic hand, like all those kind of like STEM things. And then we have me over here with agriculture. And I know I fit under science in the whole science, technology, engineering and mathematics component. But this weekend has really opened my eyes to see of how many other things under that STEM umbrella that agriculture can actually fit in. So if you haven't given me your card, could you please just drop it off at my table over there? Because I think there's an avenue for every single one of us to make that connection and have those like commitments, right, to move forward. So I don't do well with 10 minutes. You've got eight. <laughs> Set timer for eight minutes. There we go. Okay, so I'll buzz and I'll know. So Olnoeg Counting down. <laughs> <laughs> so Olnoeg Education Center and what I do is we had the opportunity with United Way and the federal government through COVID funding to be able to place five geothermal um, greenhouses in five different communities. So Olnoeg Education Center actually services all of Mi'kma'ki which is not just Atlantic provinces, but you know, a little bit up into Quebec and into Maine. I haven't had the privilege yet to go to, into the States, into the Maine, to be able to do that. And I'm beginning with Quebec. But most of our gardens, or all of our gardens, I should say, we have one in Mjabugeg, Newfoundland, which is also known as Con River. We have Eel River Bar, which is northern New Brunswick, like Dalhousie side. We have Annapolis Valley First Nations. We have Budladeck, Cape Breton, which also is known as Cape Breton, or Cape Breton, also known as Chapel Island. And we have Lennox Island First Nations in PEI. So that's why I say I can connect with all of you, right? You're from all the different provinces. And I really, I almost like, I just want to take the next year and go on tour and see what you're doing. Because all of you, it's kind of like I feel like I should have went first because I feel like we are still in the beginning stages where you guys are making it happen. And I want to do everything you guys are doing. And I'm like, okay, how can I do this? How can I, okay, I got to take her, can I fit her in my suitcase? Like, you know, all those different things. Um, but I think what we've done in our community is we've started, right? So we have 30 by 60 foot greenhouses. We have the geothermal underneath. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to grow 365 days a year. But like I said, we're beginning. So we're doing a lot of like obstacle jumping and going under and doing all these things where I think you guys have already maybe have come across this. So I'm going to reach out to you. But the idea of um, the greenhouses is to bring that food security back to our communities. So when we had our meeting with the panelists um, 
that night um, a couple of weeks ago. One thing I spoke about is I know a lot of our Indigenous communities um, are not isolated in the way that we think of Northern Quebec or Northern Ontario. Like sometimes people are like, oh, well, I've been through that community. I just drive right through it. But I think we got to go back to community and the struggles in some of our communities might be something as simple as transportation. So even um, the grocery store, it might be like 20 minutes or 30 minutes down the road. The struggle is I'm on a fixed income. I don't have transportation. I don't have that vehicle. I can't just go and grab the fresh produce, right? Um, so I'm either tagging on with somebody else or I'm, I'm asking somebody else, hey, when you're going in, for example, um, Chapel Island, when you're going to St. Peter's, can I jump on with you because I need to get groceries? So then it comes back to how long is that fresh produce going to store? Because my fixed income, I might not get an, my, other, my next income until two weeks, right? Or at the end of the next month. So I find those are the things that we're up against. So with this project and the greenhouses, we're trying to bring that into community so people don't have to worry about that um, extra, I'm going to call it baggage, right? Like, because it really is, they're carrying this. So jump and ship here. I used to um, teach in the public school system and CCRCE had the thing like, what's in your backpack? So have that in mind when our youth are coming or our kids are coming um, to school. Like they're bringing in their backpack a lot more than what we think and everybody's backpack is different. So I bring that back to the greenhouse in our indigenous communities. It's like there's different things that are holding them back to access like and have food security. So bringing these greenhouses into our communities hopefully is lessening that. But we're coming up against different obstacles. Like one thing we had the table back there and we were talking about a couple of weeks ago, just before Fiona, actually it was the Friday of Fiona, I had stopped again in Budladek First Nation and there was a whole row of Swiss char and there was a whole row of plum tomatoes. And I'm like, so John, what are you doing with that? And they're harvesting it but they're not harvesting it for community. They're harvesting it to be thrown in the compost pile. And so I'm like having like, <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, what are you doing with that, John? And he's like, well, I don't, I don't have people in community that want it, right? Now I know they have accessed um, Cape Breton Food Hub. Um, I don't know if you're in the room here, but I know they have access that venue to be able to disperse that extra produce. Um, but of course, their first goal is community first. So then we have the second row of tomatoes, right? Plum tomatoes. And I'm like, what do you do with those? And he's like, compost. Especially when we're Friday of Fiona, right? Like we talked about, um, the last one talked about Thanksgiving, right? And she went around and she, she collected all the food because she didn't want her producers to be able to, like that food to go to waste. So I think that was the same situation in Budladek. So I go with my reusable bag and I'm like, okay. And I pick my green tomatoes and I'm like, okay, John, how much? And he's like, 40 bucks. I'm like, 40 bucks? Damn, man, you're going to put that stuff in the compost and you're ch charging me 40 bucks? This is in my head. And I'm like, ch ch stop it, right? I give him the 40 bucks. But as I'm walking away from that, I'm thinking, that's where Olnoeg needs to step up and we need to go the next step which would be the storage and the preserving and that kind of thing. So I love the fact that we have these greenhouses in community and I think it's a great opportunity. I now have to make that next step into preserving. And I just want to let you know that we started in 2020, I think March 2020, I got hired and we were halfway through the program. But as you all know, COVID shut everybody down for everything. Like I know here in Nova Scotia, we were down to community lockdown. So it's like communities are calling me going, what's going on with the greenhouse? I'm like, yeah, I'm kind of on community lockdown. Like I really can't go there, unfortunately, and start building, right? Because there was a lot of those different barriers. We've gotten through that. We have three out of the five that are completely um, growing. I got two minutes. Well, one oh. and a half. No, it's joking. <laughs> so we have three out of the five that are actually growing, and the other two want to open the space to community to find out how and what community would like to do in the greenhouse. So I know Naples Valley First Nations, they're, they now own, I don't know if you guys know, but they now own Webster Farms. So Webster Farms is actually our first ever Indigenous-owned commercial size farm in Nova Scotia. 
So if you have connection with Thompson Beans, I'm sorry, but I'm only buying Webster's now. Like, <laughs> so um, even with that, they want to open it up. So it's almost like a holistic approach. Like we're talking about food security, but there's always another side to it too. And Annapolis Valley First Nation wants to open it up and they're open to the idea of even if it's um, medicine, traditional medicines, right? Um, and if that's what their community is open to and they want to grow in their greenhouse, they're going to open that up too. Because we know it is, it's completely entire holistic, right? In order to heal yourself, you have to heal with food, but you also have to heal spiritually and bringing that back. And I guess that's pretty much it. 958. Oh. <laughs> amazing no you guys keep those so we have two you guys have done this before like the problem fortunately for me i've either been on stage or back at the registration desk so i have missed a lot of this exchange but we have two microphones um so if you do want to speak and that's why maria we couldn't hear you we want to capture your thoughts so make sure you've got your hand up and we'll get a microphone, and uh, we'll, let it, we'll let the panel um, respond if they all want to respond to it, or you can ask a specific person a question. So who would like to go first? Or I'll pick people. Oh, we got one back. Okay, um, the last panel had two food hubs, one being a nonprofit and one being a for-profit business, and I didn't have the chance to ask a question then, but I think it's also relevant here as we have four, I think, nonprofits up there. Um, I just wondered if any of you wanted to comment on that structure for addressing food security and some of these food systems issues um, compared to the business model. Just any thoughts or comments? I wouldn't mind responding to that. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question. And, um, you know, in this day and age, uh, not-for-profits that are relying on grants and donations are not going to make it. They have to use a social enterprise model. So, um, you know, part of, like, Greater Torches to Moving Forward is a not-for-profit social enterprise. So it actually runs a community hub already. It's not food-related. That generates enough money to pay for most of their programs. They also set up a, a, a concurrent other for-profit organization. So there's a lot of options, even with charities now. I mean, that's moving or changing the Canada Revenue Agency, where charities were very limited in what they could do as social enterprise in the past, and that's all changing. So, you know, for profit, profit is not bad itself. It's how you use it. So, you know, if you're giving it all to Elon Musk, um, yeah, it's bad if he's just going to send some rocket ships off into the um, atmosphere. But if you're using it to do good, then, you know, the for-profit model is definitely something I think that we all need to be looking at more seriously. It is a different mindset. You're more likely to attract business people that, you know, have some experience and ability to help versus, you know, in the past it's been... Not-for-profits have been folks that have got good intentions and want to help, but might not have those skills to be able to drive, you know, an enterprise forward and make it sustainable. Yeah. Um, I'll add my two cents to that as well. Um, I, think, I think the local food is one small step to a greater vision. And that is transitioning to a more ecological civilization. And it's easy to start with local food because we could all relate to it. We all eat. We all can grow food to some degree and support local farmers. But uh, in doing so, I think we have to uh, really focus on what the point is. And is the point to, if the it, it, the point has to be about feeding people and supporting living ecosystems in agriculture land, on agricultural land. If, if we're doing this just to maximize profit, uh, really, what's the point? You know, it's like uh, uh, the current food system is so incredibly efficient that as soon as they see an opportunity in local food, I mean, they'll just take it over. They'll co-opt it. You know? So, yeah, we operate as a nonprofit, but as Wendy mentioned, we also 
uh, you know, have our own self-supporting initiatives as well. Um, we, uh, like if we need a ton of organic pelletized fertilizer, we'll buy two tons and we'll package up a ton and sell that at a cost so that we recoup the expense of our own fertilizer. And we do that with liquid fish emulsion, we do that with limestone, right? Like for a gardener that has a 100 square foot bed, uh, you know, if they can only buy a 50 pound bag of lime, they might not buy any lime. So we'll package it up and, uh, and sell it in appropriate scales for the community gardeners. Uh, we have food dryers, and so we collect uh, our herbs and we make tea. And actually, uh, COVID was really good for us. We made a, a, an antiviral tea out of a sage, peppermint, thyme, and oregano, which was quite popular. Um, and, uh, and then the therapeutic horticulture program uh, is not totally self-supporting, but the organizations that participate uh, do pay uh, a small portion of that. Now, I think it's really important, and one of the things I wanted to mention in the talk that I ran out of time was, was that it's really important, especially if you're at as a nonprofit, but, but any small farm, is to do something on the land besides growing food. Okay? Uh, like we're expanding our therapeutic horticulture program and Legacy Garden into a, another farm that uh, IBS manages. And uh, we, just, we just planted a three acre orchard, we have a vineyard, but we also <laughs> built a bio shelter that has a greenhouse and a woodworking shop. So actually Fiona's been very good to us in supplying oodle amounts of, uh, of hardwood <laughs> that we will turn into baseball bats and candles and table legs and bowls and dishes and whatnot. Um, so there's all sorts of things that you can do like that. Um, the other thing too, and I'll be real quick, I'll, uh, I'll end this real quickly, is I remember years ago I, uh, I hosted a, a conference at the Farm Center and one of the presenters talked about where what he grows on his farm is actually a side product. That what he specializes in is selling information. And so we do that to a degree at the Legacy Garden. We did uh, uh, field trials for a number of years, I think three years in a row, on developing an enzyme for uh, in increasing the biological activity in the soil. Uh, this past year we did a field trial with acorn on various crops that uh, local farmers are saving seed for. So there's numerous things that you can do and still be a nonprofit in your food production. Yeah. Okay, right, we'll get Catherine. We're gonna try to get one or two more questions in. Um, so we'll, we'll, Catherine, and then we'll go over to. I, I do wanna say that, um, you know, like there is not an actual shortage of food in this world. It's a distribution problem. Um, there's not a shortage of money in this world. It's a distribution problem. So um, I think that uh, as a nonprofit, I, I mean, I, we have an incredible fundraiser. And so a lot of what we're doing is we're connecting with sources of money to bring that to community. You know, we all live for a day when the nonprofit doesn't have to be the middleman. Um, and the, uh, the people are, are getting what they need without us. Um, and I will say, same with information. So. Um, I, I talked about the, you know, the sort of the some of the stages of food security. You know, we're doing the sort of emergency food thing. We're providing food, we're providing meals. We're doing the, um, you know, the education, the awareness part. You know, people making social connections. But I didn't talk about the advocacy part, and that is really important as well. Is you know, as, as a nonprofit worker, as an organization, we are getting tons of information about what is happening on the ground for people. Um, and then because of our connections, we are able to bring that information and figure out, okay, here's the main issue we're seeing. What are we gonna do with that information most effectively to do advocacy work to our government, to organizations? So I think that that's also really key is, you know, I mean, and I didn't talk about that so much because that's not so much my personal role. My personal role is, you know, on the farm and in the market. Um, but we do have an advocacy office as well, and that's working with individuals to um, navigate the very complex systems that people living in poverty have to um, navigate. But also that advocacy office is working on campaigns. Um, and um, a lot of the time, you know, um, uh, Policymakers, politicians, just, you know, they don't have the information about what's happening on the ground. So we're bringing that information as well, and I think that that's really important. So I think, um, yeah, to me, I, I personally feel like, you know, as, as a nonprofit, you, you can function 
Um, it's just also knowing like what, what is the purpose. The purpose is getting food in people's bellies, helping them make connections, you know, um, education, but it's also the advocacy piece for us. And I think you need all three because the advocacy piece is the slowest and the hardest and the hardest and the least immediate and you know what our community is, you know, not always the most running to get people people show up to our programs for the meals. Um, and that's great. Um, so I think, you know, having having kind of a, a multi-pronged approach is also important. Okay, I'm yes. Um, I'm making the executive decision because we started seven minutes late to give us seven extra minutes so we can have Maria and hopefully at least one more question. So, Maria? Well, I... I Maria, keep, it? Keep, keep, them, keep it about four or five inches yeah, away. I wasn't sure if I wanted to speak about this now or later when there, the summarization of the charts happened. But Catherine said something that is pretty much what I want to say. I want to connect three dots of things that repeatedly uh, uh, came up during this meeting in different panels, different parts, okay? And um, this, and I'm gonna explain why I interrupted Phil. Because it, repeatedly during this, uh, this event, we have been hearing how you have that there's barriers. There's barriers and many of these barriers come from government and from, come from where the pro, how the programs are designed and how, and then you run into these things and they're just kind of getting in the way of things happening and the rhythm that it should be happening. And at the same time, I'm hearing other people saying, well, we have to do it, we cannot just do it, we have to, we cannot depend on government. Yeah, but when, to reach a certain scale and a real impact and move into a more ecological society that you just mentioned, Phil, uh, then, then you have to deal with the barriers and the barriers are in government. And then I have also, where Josh and I were trying to summarize the things that people put in the charts and we were struggling with the diversity and inclusion part and how we word it because if you look at this meeting, um, I'm sorry, folks, because, but this meeting is overwhelmingly white. <laughs> and and the, uh, the, the inclusion of perspectives, and we have hearing, like, I'm sure my, many of you or all of us got inspired by the story of Grower Station and Diane Gonzalez. A role in, in making that happen, okay? And that wouldn't have happened if Diane Gonzalez would, would not have been in a position of having some agency and being taken into account and not just showing the uh, declaration. And then, so the- So do you but, have a question? No, I, okay. have a, I have an observation. Okay. That I have, I'm going to explain why I interrupted Phil, because the story or the genesis of the Legacy Garden also had to do with somebody who was from a diverse, a diverse background or whatever, an underrepresented community who had agency and was empowered. And that person was me. And the, this, yes, and the seed money for the Legacy Garden came from a project that wouldn't have happened if I hadn't pushed this weird, really weird out of the box idea very hard that supposedly was a collaboration to show the history of Agriculture PI with $250,000. And the reassessment of the land uh, because they have assessed this land for as comprehensive development or whatever because it was on University Avenue and it was a ridiculous rent. It was I who ordered the assessment as agricultural zoning because, and I had to oppose it and make uh, like a burn uh, a little bit of capital there, but that was because I have a little bit of power and a little bit of agency mm -hmm. and, it, and if I hadn't been there, probably nobody had thought about those things, okay? So, and we were listening to Don here, we are listening to many people, so we have to include more diverse voices, and, and the diverse voices will focus on the barriers because they're used to facing barriers, and the barriers need to be addressed and removed, and that's where 
Catherine was saying, we have to put more effort in advocacy. Mm -hmm. And that's how it ties together. And this is sorry, Phil, that I interrupted. I think the Legacy Garden it was your uh, brain, brain, how do you say your Brian, I'm just gonna ask you brain to creation? Quick, to, just Thank to, you very much. Yeah. And I agree with it, making the society more ecological. Okay. But sometimes, you know, like it's nice yeah. to connect the dots. Okay, perfect. Thank you. We're going to try for one more question. Is there one more? One more question? Yes, one more right up here. Uh, Susan, we've got one more in the second row. And then we will, uh, uh, did you guys want to maybe, comp if you want to talk about what Maria said and then this one, you can wrap it together, is that? Okay. Thank you. Um, so I've been asked to help with the community garden and the infrastructure is amazing. It's all set up, there's over 50 plots, greenhouses, everything else. Um, they did it kind of backwards though in that five people basically started it and unfortunately now they're aging and they're not able to keep it going. Um, so they have community, they have members and that, um, but they're to the point that they're actually having to scale back and concerned about the longevity of the garden. So I've been sending emails, making phone calls, hosting, trying to host like community cleanup days and that kind of thing, but nobody's coming. And so we're really struggling because we can't get people to like mow the lawn and do those kind of tasks. Everything is there, so I'm just looking for any other ideas about how to get our people back to helping and really making it community and not five people and everybody doing their own thing there. Thank you. Where are you located? Uh, outside of St. Oh, St. John, St. John, New Brunswick. <laughs> I, oh, sorry. I don't have the mic. I will. So. Okay, yeah, I will talk. Go figure. Hello? Okay. So I just want to touch base on two things. Um, going back to the very first question about sustainability, we actually have incorporated a sustainability business plan with our greenhouses, which is not sustainable environmentally, but sustainable as how we're going to to like keep this going. Because it was great to get the funding for the infrastructure, but now we need to move forward. Which I think links in with your question, is how do I get that engagement? And I know myself and our organization, the way we're gonna try to do it is, instead of us, even though we're indigenously led, I'm still not gonna go into that community and say, this is what you need, okay? Um, historically, the government has done that, we're gonna fix you, right? Like everybody does that, we're gonna go in, we're gonna fix you, we're gonna, we're gonna, this is what you need, this is how, you know, how we need to do it. So I think it comes back to your question is, how do you get that engagement? I think you need to go to the community and get their voice and their opinion. Cause I think once you do what they're wanting to do, then you're gonna get them to come in to support and to help you. And then you ask that person say, hey, you got an extra 10 minutes, can you model on? Right? So I think that's the best way. That's how I'm going to approach it, me going forward, because I think we kind of did it the, la the same way. We went greenhouse first, and now we're trying to figure out what to do. And I'm going to let Catherine do a minute, and then I've been told by the big kahuna we are done. So uh, <laughs> Catherine, you get to wrap up with something inspiring. Go. Oh, <laughs> okay. Um, I would just say, you know, go where the energy is. So for, for me, I, you know, I don't know the population of St. John super well, but... Um, we found that we had a lot of newcomers who just really had a lot of experience in gardening. Um, so I connected with um, the Immigrant Services of Nova Scotia, ISANS. So I don't know if there's a similar organization and just let them know that we had space and now we have, you know, we're, we're, we have a, a lot of people who are interested. There's a nearby community garden that's having kind of a similar issue. And I, I think that part of it is also that the people who have been involved um, want people to come and be involved in the way that they want people to be involved. And that's, that's ch challenging for people, you know. It's, um, it's, it's a little bit of letting go as well, and, and that's, um, that's hard and, um, you know, it's, it's an ongoing struggle. But I think also knowing that the people are there who want to be part of your garden, um, it's just, yeah, words barriers are coming up. Like, why, why are they not in the garden, right? And some of it might be that they don't want to do it the way that other people have done it, so they're like, well, we'll go somewhere else then, you know? So I, I think that's, that's all I'll say, yeah. Well, and, and hey, we're transitioning into a topic table, and this group 